resilient, highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. Hey, what's up everyone? It's Ryan here from The Y, and today we're gonna be taking a look at Inception. Now, admittedly, I feel like I do say, oh, this is the best movie ever, a lot. But all those other times I was lying, and I actually mean it now. I think my love for the film really comes down to a fascination with the many ideas it covers. The main focus is obviously dreams and memories, yet it also touches on abstract concepts such as time, reality, the unconscious mind, and letting go. Just super trippy ideas explored through a fun and unique premise. On that note, let's get right into the video. Here are 30 facts you didn't know about Inception. Before Leonardo DiCaprio was chosen for the role of Dom Cobb, both Brad Pitt and Will Smith declined the part. When it came to Brad Pitt, it's been reported that Nolan handed him the script and then only gave him 48 hours to come to a decision, though it's less clear if it was the deadline that soured things or if the script just wasn't to his liking. In Will Smith's case, he actually wanted to change the plot to him planting the idea into Fisher's mind that he was to keep all mention of his wife's name out of his mouth. Yet Nolan couldn't agree to those terms. Nah, but the real reason being that Smith was on a sabbatical from acting to look after his family more, beginning in 2008 and ending in 2012. Although none of the film went down in space like Nolan's Interstellar, they still had to deal with the headache of mimicking zero gravity in the hotel sequence. One small detail that made things way easier though, was simply putting Elliot Page's hair into a tight bun. It all came down to the fact that long hair is quite unpredictable in zero gravity, and they sure as hell didn't want to have to mess around with that. And looking at other films with zero gravity, this is far from an isolated case. Take for example Gravity and Interstellar. Short hair was used for the same reason. Long hair is a bitch to animate correctly in space. In the making of Inception, very few special effects were used throughout the entirety of the movie. This might come as a bit of a shocker considering the mind-bending subject matter of dreams. Yet many shots including the Penrose stairs, zero gravity hallway, and even the mountain avalanche were all created with practical effects. All in all, the film only relied upon about 500 VFX shots, a meager amount compared to most superhero and sci-fi epics, many of which contained 4 to 5 times that amount. As you'll see by the end of this video, pretty much every character's name carries a symbolic meaning. Let's start with the couple that the movie's built around, Dom and Mal Cobb. By definition, the word Dom is derived from the Latin word domus, meaning home, and is additionally related to words like domicile and domesticated, obviously referring to what Dom is searching for the entire film. Mal, on the other hand, translates to bad or ill in French, Spanish, and Portuguese, which is exactly what she's become to Dom's mind. We had our time together, and I have to let you go. Inception's final runtime is 2 hours and 28 minutes. This is in fact a reference to Edith Piaf's Non Je No Regrets Rion, or the kick song, which has a length of 2 minutes and 28 seconds. Also interesting is that the movie's runtime is exactly 8,888 seconds. Not sure if that means anything, but cool nonetheless. Like I said, almost every name is a reference of some kind, and the chemist Yusuf was no different. His name was derived from the Arabic version of Joseph, a biblical figure from Genesis who helped the pharaoh interpret dreams. Then you have Robert and Maurice Fisher. As I'm sure you're aware, Bobby is a nickname for Robert, making Robert Fisher a callback to the chess champion Bobby Fisher. And looking at his father, the name Maurice was an homage to MC Escher, whose art greatly inspired Nolan during the making of the film. Because there aren't any guides out there on how to assemble a team for dream heists, Nolan drew upon what he knew best, making films. For that reason, he structured the team like a movie production. Cobb as the director, Arthur being the producer, Eames the actor, Ariadne doing set design, Saito the studio, and finally Fisher as the audience. I mean, all I can say is, what a goddamn gem of a metaphor. But you'd have to buy out the entire cabin and the first class flight attendant. I bought the airline. The third dream level sees the team infiltrating an alpine fortress on skis. I always felt like there was something very familiar about the entire sequence, but just could never put my finger on it. So it all made sense when I learned that it was inspired by the classic James Bond film, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. The inception of Inception began as a distant thought when Christopher Nolan was only 16. 
it started with him just being fascinated by the nature of dreams and really viewing them as another state of reality eager to be explored. Nolan let it all simmer in his head for a number of years and then finally began work on preliminary drafts around the year 2000. But after pitching the concept of a low-budget inception to Warner Bros in 2001, he soon realized that it was never going to work. Nolan said, as soon as you're talking about dreams, the potential of the human mind is infinite, and so the scale of the film has to feel infinite. The problem was, back in 2001, he had next to no experience directing large-scale movies. So he embarked on a journey which included Batman Begins, The Prestige, and The Dark Knight. And by the end of it, he was at last ready to make into reality the idea he'd been pondering for the past 25 years. Do you want to take a leap of faith? Or become an old man filled with regret? Because Inception was developed over such a long period of time, the script went through many different iterations and even genre changes. Nolan first conceived it as a horror flick, as people invading your dreams certainly does sound frightening, but he eventually settled on the idea of making it a heist film. Yet there was still one final puzzle left for him to solve. You see, when you talk about most films in the heist genre, Nolan wrote, Traditionally, they are very deliberately superficial in emotional terms, and because the nucleus of Inception was made up of dreams and memories, topics which are inherently emotional, that conventional format just wasn't going to cut it. Thus, when you look at the final product, Inception's still in the heist genre, but that aspect of it is really nothing more than a thin outer shell. The final puzzle piece for Nolan was figuring out that the driving force of the movie had to be Cobb's emotional journey. Why is it so important to dream? My dreams were still together. Now we all know that totems are the way to tell if you're in your own reality or another person's dream. Ariadne's was a chess piece, Arthur possessed a loaded die, and Cobb seemingly had the spinning top. But was that actually his totem? Cobb did say it was originally Maul's, so that means he would have had to have had his own. And secondly, the idea of a spinning top as a totem never made much sense in the first place, as even in a dream, it wouldn't be expected to keep spinning forever. This is all to say, I think the more likely case is that Cobb's totem was his wedding ring. Giving credence to this theory is the fact that Cobb wears his wedding ring only in dreams, and never when he's awake. Of course, he never divulges what makes the ring unique enough to use as a totem, but if I had to spend 50 plus years in limbo, I'd be pretty secretive about my totem too. Limbo is going to become your reality. You're going to be lost down there so long that you're going to become an old man. In an effort to combat confusion, TV broadcasts of Inception in Japan actually contains text displaying what dream level they're currently on in the corner of the screen. Which I honestly don't understand. I feel like the movie's pretty easy to follow along with. I mean, it's not like we're talking about Tenet or something. During the research phase in production, Christopher Nolan basically did no homework at all when it came to dreams. He explained further, A lot of what I find you want to do with research is just confirming things you want to do. If the research contradicts what you want to do, you tend to go ahead and do it anyway. Being as subjective as possible and really trying to write from something genuine is the way to go. And according to a dream researcher at Harvard, this is true in the sense that dreams tend to have very illogical, rambling, disjointed kinds of plots, which makes it all the more clear why Nolan didn't go with the objective viewpoint of dreams for Inception. You never really remember the beginning of a dream, do you? You always wind up right in the middle of what's going on. During the opening act, Cobb traverses Saito's dream and quietly attempts to steal from his subconscious. In the process of doing so, he kills one of the guards and so as not to make a sound, catches the bullet casing in his hand. Or should I say, rather attempted to, because it sure looks like he dropped it. In the film, Ariadne's job as the architect was to design mazes within the dream to assist in the Fisher Inception job. Alluding to this is her name, which was derived from the ancient Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. As the story goes, Ariadne was the daughter of King Minos and aided Theseus in escaping the labyrinth by giving him a ball of red thread. This parallels Inception as Ariadne accompanied Cobb into the labyrinth of his own mind and provided the tools necessary to deal with his own kind of Minotaur trapped in his subconscious. You're trying to keep her alive. Can't let her go. The red thread also explains why Ariadne dons the same color for the majority of the film. And one last callback to the myth involves the final puzzle that Ariadne draws, as the sketch depicted is the same labyrinth of the Minotaur. 
As if Inception wasn't already immersive enough, Nolan said they were very close to releasing a 3D version. However, because of time constraints along with some reservations surrounding a dimmer image quality, he ultimately put the kibosh on it. Though after reading about how close they were, I sort of think some of the dream levels would look sick in 3D. Prior to Inception, Nolan had been trying for years to work with DiCaprio, yet was unable to make it happen. What finally got him on board with Inception was this concept of the world of dreams and how it all related back to reality. Going off that, after he was cast, the two spent months discussing the screenplay and DiCaprio was even a huge contributing factor in making it less of a puzzle and more of a character-driven story. If you take the first letter from each of the main characters' first names, Dom, Robert, Eames, Arthur, Maul, and Saito, it spells out dreams. Add in a few more names, Peter, Ariadne, and Yusuf, you get the phrase, dreams pay. You mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. While the main concept of Inception is very much original, Nolan drew inspiration from a variety of different mediums. He cites Jorge Luis Borges and two short stories of his, The Secret Miracle and The Circular Ruins, both of which involve dreams as major influences. Then there's Blade Runner and The Matrix, which by now have probably inspired most sci-fi films in the 21st century. And finally, there's the animated film Paprika, which, much like Inception, deals with entering other people's dreams. But it goes further than that, as comparing the two films, many of the shots are so similar that a few people have even claimed that Inception somewhat ripped off Paprika. Christopher Nolan initially had someone else in mind for the role of Maul Cobb, and that was Kate Winslet. She declined after not being able to see herself playing the character, though had she accepted, it would have been her and DiCaprio's third collaboration after Titanic and Revolutionary Road. And maybe it was fated to be, as the Maul we got, Marion Cotillard, has a pretty strange connection to the film that Nolan swears is just a coincidence. That's to say, Cotillard actually played Edith Piaf in La Villa and Rose, the same woman who sang the kick song. In the first level of the dream state, the license plate slogans read, The Alternate State. By now it should be obvious that the kick song permeates through many different aspects of the film, and one more area where the song's influence can be found is in the soundtrack. Hans Zimmer explained, All of the music in the score is subdivisions and multiplications of the tempo of the Edith Piaf track. The most clear-cut example can be heard in Inception's main theme. Now listen to the Edith Piaf song used to alert the dreamers. And then let me slow it down a bit. And there you go, it's not perfect, but you can definitely get an idea of how he made it. Even though it's hard to imagine anyone else's Ariadne besides Elliot Page, Evan Rachel Wood was the first person to be considered for the part. Other actresses considered include Emily Blunt, Rachel McAdams, Emma Roberts, and believe it or not, Taylor Swift was in the running at one point in time. They're still looking at us. Yeah, it's worth a shot. Time is definitely an aspect of reality that Christopher Nolan loves to play around with. We saw time dilation in Interstellar, time inversion in Tenet, but Inception was really the first movie he devoted to exploring the concept. Comparing the time dilation from Miller's planet in Interstellar, which saw 7 years pass for every 1 hour, in Inception, 1 hour in reality equals 12 hours in the first dream level, 6 days for level 2, almost 2.5 two months for level 3, and in Limbo, nearly 2.5 years equates to 1 hour in reality. This is all true for your standard run-of-the-mill somnicid, but for use of specialized compound which gives more time per level, the increases are exponential and one hour in this limbo equates to a little over 18 years. A few series of numbers appear multiple times in the film. First there's the number that Fisher gives under duress. 5, 2, 8, 4, 9, 1. Which again shows up as the two room numbers combine the number Eames gives to Fisher, and the combination to the safe. The next set of numbers is Cobb and Maul's anniversary suite, 3502, which appears on the front of the train and reversed on the taxicab. According to Joseph Gordon-Levitt, his first meeting with Nolan went much better than expected, as he showed up in a full suit just in case, unknowingly matching his character's wardrobe perfectly. 
And regarding the hallway fight sequence, Levitt performed every single stunt except one, and described the experience as just about the most fun I've ever had in a movie set. Excuse me planning an idea in your head. I say to you, don't think about elephants. What are you thinking about? Elephants. This line is actually a clever reference to the 2004 book, Don't Think of an Elephant by George Lakoff. The novel is a masterclass on political discourse and most notably discusses the concept of reframing ideas to suit your needs. An example being something like framing tax cuts as tax relief, reinforcing the pre-existing notion of taxes as a negative rather than a social responsibility. Without a doubt, the most innovative practical effect in Inception takes place during the hallway fight scene, since they couldn't film in outer space. They did the next best thing and built two massive sets. The first was a horizontal hallway that rotated 360 degrees, giving the impression that the actors were climbing up walls and on ceilings since the camera was attached to the floor. The second set was built vertically with the actors suspended from wires to make it look as if they were floating in zero gravity. All in all, the scenes cost a lot of money, produced many bruises, and took three weeks to film. But I'd say the end result was definitely compelling enough to make me glad they didn't just do it with CGI. Possibly out of jealousy for Cillian Murphy's eyes, Christopher Nolan loves putting bags over his head. He first had Murphy wear a bag for Scarecrow in Batman Begins, then to reprise his role in The Dark Knight. And finally, in Inception, he once again had a bag put over his head, this time as a hostage. But that's not all. Peaky Blinders followed Nolan's lead and continued the tradition of covering his face. I'm definitely pumped to see the next installment of Cloth Bag over Cillian Murphy's head, though I'm sure he doesn't feel the same way. Concerning the ending of Inception, I've always fallen on the side that it was reality for a number of reasons. First off, if you subscribe to the theory that his wedding ring was his actual totem, it's nowhere to be seen, meaning he is in reality. Secondly, I don't know about you, but the top sure looked like it was wobbling pretty substantially at the end. Next, someone asked Michael Caine what his thoughts were and he said the following, When I got the script of Inception, I was puzzled by it. And I said to Nolan, I don't understand where the dream is. Nolan replied, Well, when you're in the scene, it's reality. And obviously, because he's in the final scene, Kane believes it to be real. Finally, according to Christopher Nolan, the real point of the scene is that Cobb isn't looking at the top. He's looking at his kids. He's left it behind. That's the emotional significance of the thing. So there you have it. There is a ton of evidence pointing to him being in reality. But even if he's not, it really doesn't matter because he believes it to be true. And it doesn't matter. Now tell me why. Because you did it again. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to leave me a like and subscribe for more content like this. Alright, till next time, have a great day everyone.